evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And as is the norm, as is the norm, we always have a lot of issues to discuss in any given week. I want to begin by welcoming our vi vi viewers who are joining us on television in West Coast Barbies. Welcome to another program of issues in the news to our viewers who are joining us in Region 6, East Barbies and Quarantine Coast. Welcome to another program of issues in the news and to our Listeners who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And lastly, but not in the least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live across the length and breadth of Guyana, across the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and further afield, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. Are we, are we on? Because I'm not, I'm seeing a blank screen here. Anyway, I thought I had some technical difficulties, but let, let's proceed. So, I want to revisit a matter that I dealt with already, but the persistence of Kemrad Ramjitan in particular has caused me to want to revisit this matter. Many of you will recall I had an exchange with a commentator in relation to how monies are to be deposited in the Natural Resource Fund. The point I made in that exchange is that the Natural Resource Fund Act is the law. And that law says very clearly that all monies generated from the sector by the licensees, meaning ESO, or um, the oil company, must be, di must be deposited in a natural resource fund established in a bank account in the United States, in United States dollars. That is what the law says. The argument that they are advancing is that you must separate taxes and only put in the fund an amount that is net of tax. Well, the law doesn't say that. The Natural Resource Fund Act says that revenues from the oil sector must go into that fund. And they define, the law defines what is revenue. It defines what is revenue. So I don't understand the failure to appreciate that if the laws of the country says this, then the law must be complied with. Now, those who have to take taxes, etc., they may, I don't know, they will have to do so by some other arrangement. But if the law says that all the money must go into the fund, then all the money must go into the fund. I made the point that the law cannot bend and bow to accounting principles. It's the other way around. Accounting principles must bend and bow to the law. I also made the point that the Natural Resource Fund Act itself provides that if it is in conflict with any other law, the act must prevail. So whichever taxing statute is on the books and says otherwise, the Natural Resource Fund Act will prevail. So whatever that act says, that is the law that will govern the way revenue is received, invested, 
deposited, spent, and or withdrawn. And that is, the, that is the point I was trying to make. My attention was drawn to a press conference held by the Alliance for Change, where Mr. Kemrad Ramjatan, the leader of the Alliance for Change, joined the debate and says that I am wrong and that the commentator is correct. So I want you to listen to Mr. Ramjitang. I will ask the operator to play what he had to say. And then I'll respond and I will show you how wrong he is by citing the very authorities that he is relying on. So operator, play Mr. Ramjitang's video. Okay. Uh, this has to do with the debate between Christopher Ram and Eugene and Lau. The AFC has noted the debate between A.G. and Lau and Mr. Christopher Ram concerning the Natural Resource Fund and what revenues should not be in it and the Consolidated Fund and what revenues should be in it from the receipts of Guyana's share of the oil monies consequent upon the 2016 PSA. There is undoubtedly a misapprehension, if not an incomprehension, by the government's chief legal advisor in the issue. The AFC commends Mr. Ram for bringing clarity to the public on the matter and to force an understanding into the learned Attorney General when a series of questions were posed to him. These questions are still to be answered by the Attorney General, who has surprisingly gone non-responsive. As is correctly posited by Mr. Ram, the Natural Resource Fund is a sovereign wealth fund created under special separate legislation to govern, manage, invest, and use our oil monies. This fund has a completely different structure and purpose from the Consolidated Fund, which is effectively the operating fund for the financial operations of ministries, departments, and budget agencies, and which is managed by public servants in a decentralized framework. Since the payment of the taxes for Exxon must be paid out of the revenues from the Ghana government, pursuant to the terms of the 2016 PSA, and since this government believes in sanctity of contract, it necessarily follows that the corporate taxes must be paid to GRA and placed into the consolidated fund. This payment thus lessens the amount received into the NRF or consolidated fund is increased to the extent of that amount. The point as to where public monies should be deposited was apparently missed by the Attorney General. The AFC wishes to remind everyone that Section 38, one of the Financial Management and Accountability Act 2003 provides this. All public monies raised or received by the government shall be credited fully and promptly to the consolidated fund, except A, monies credited to an extra budgetary fund as stipulated in the enabling legislation establishing that fund. Now, this statutory provision accords with Article 216 of the Constitution, and I need not read out that lengthy constitutional provision. The AFC asserts that the Natural Resource Fund and the Consolidated Fund are thus separate things. So the oil company corporate taxes paid by the government of Ghana to the GRA must be sent to the Consolidated Fund. And the rest of the oil earnings must go to the Natural Resource Fund. So the supremacy of the law on this situation must lie with the Constitution and the specific legislation, Section 38.1 of the 
Financial Management and Accountability Act, rather than the NRF as erroneously posited by the Attorney General. The fact of leaving the revenues in the NRF fattens that fund, increases that fund to the correspondence, um, corresponding thinning of the consolidated fund. Since the NRF is to be only used as per section 16.2 of the NRF to finance one, national development priorities and two, major national disasters, this NRF will continue to be abused as the government will declare any contract to its friends and family as national development priorities. There is thus a method to the madness of overstating the NRF to the extent of an equivalent understatement of the consolidated fund. Thank you, operator. So you heard Mr. Ramjetan very clearly. So I'll take my time and dissect what he said. Now, Ramjetan makes the point that Section 38 of the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act creates this extra budgetary fund. And uh, no, it's not create an extra budgetary fund, but speaks to where public monies are to be deposited. And he's absolutely correct. So let me read it for you. All monies, all public monies, raised or received by the government, shall be credited fully and promptly to the consolidated fund, except monies credited to an extra budgetary fund as stipulated in the enabling legislation establishing that fund. Let's go again, slowly. All public monies raised or received by the government, I pause here to say that this will include revenues generated from the oil and gas sector to be paid to the government. So all public monies, including those revenues, from the oil and gas sector, raised or received by the government, shall be credited fully and promptly to the consolidated fund, no problem so far, except monies credited to an extra budgetary fund as stipulated in the enabling legislation establishing that fund. My friends, Ramjetan does not understand that the natural resource fund is an extra budgetary fund that is being referred to here. So if it is not to be put in the consolidated fund, it must be credited to an extra budgetary fund as stipulated in the enabling legislation establishing that fund. The enabling legislation is the Natural Resource Fund Act and it establishes the fund exactly in the manner that the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act says. It says this, Establishment of a Natural Resource Fund Act, Natural Resource Fund, pay Section 3. Section 3 says, There is established a fund to be known as the Natural Resource Fund. This is exactly what the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act is speaking about. Monies should be paid promptly and fully into the consolidated fund, except monies credited to an extra budgetary fund, as stipulated in an enabling legislation establishing the fund. This is the legislation, the Natural Resource Fund Act, that establishes 
an extra budgetary fund called the Natural Resource Fund Act. And this act says that the monies must be paid directly into the fund. Section 15 says, petroleum revenues shall be directly paid into a bank account denominated in United States dollars and held by the bank as part of the fund. It, I can't get simpler and more simplistic than this. The simple application, reading and application of the law, Mr. Ramjetan gets wrong. And it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. They passed an act in 2019 called the Natural Resource Fund Act of 2019. That act we repealed in 2021 with a new act. But when you look at the section that Ramjatan finds objectionable, that is the section that speaks to where petroleum revenues shall be directed, it is identical, identical to the very section in our 2021 Act. There, in their Act, it was Section 21, and in the, our Act, it is Section 15. I have asked the operator to put the two sections alongside each other. Put it up on the screen so that people can read both sections. And you will see that they are identical. You get to get here, operator? Leave it on the screen so that people can see it. And I'll continue to speak while it is up. Is it up yet? So look on your screen. You're supposed to be able to see two pieces of paper. You will see one is the official gazette dated 23rd of January 2019. That is their act. The title might be a little wrong, Tax Amendment Act. That's not, forget that for the time being. But look at section 21. And then look at section 15 of the 30th of December 2021 document. The 21 document is ours. The 2019 document is theirs. You will see that the two sections are identical. Now, Kemrat Ramjetan was part of this government that passed this act. I'll speak about a little about the passing of the act a little later. But he was part of that AFC, APNU government that passed Section 21. We didn't change Section 21. We replicated as Section 15. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. So I don't know how Ramjetan has a problem with our legislation, but he had no problem with theirs. Christopher Ram. The commentator to whom I replied is the same thing. This 2019 act obviously was passed since 2019. The commentator had the whole of 2019. He didn't make no objection. 2021, 20, 2020, 2021, 2022, and in 2023, the ending of 2023, five years after, he discovered this eureka moment. That something is wrong with the legislation. That it doesn't provide for taxes to be paid by GRA. It didn't provide for taxes to be paid by GRA because that is how the government structured it. You can't argue that the law is wrong. And you are right. And what is worse for Mr. Ramjetan? is that his 2019 act was passed in the parliament after they were defeated by a no-confidence motion. They were defeated by a no-confidence motion in 2018. They went back surreptitiously and illegally into the parliament, into the National Assembly, and passed the most important piece of legislation 
in the history of Guyana, behind the back of the opposition, we didn't know about this. We didn't know that they're going to have a sitting. We read about this in the newspapers. One sitting and they passed all three stages of the legislation in violation of the standing orders. You have to lay the bill, then you have to debate it, you have to wait seven days, then debate it, and then pass it. All three stages of the bill, they rush through at one sitting. In the absence of the opposition, we were in the opposition. And after the government was defeated by a no confidence motion, when the constitution says very clearly that once you are defeated by the a no confidence motion, parliament is dissolved and you must fix a date for elections within three months. They proceeded to the parliament after their defeat, refusing to dissolve it instead hold a sitting of the parliament and pass the law. The most important piece of law. So I decided to spend some time to reveal to you the inconsistency, the recklessness, the incompetence, the duplicity, and the hypocrisy of Kemraj Ramjatan when he speaks on this matter. And that is the level of duplicity and incompetence which permeate the entire opposition. Ramjatan is among the competent ones. You can imagine the rest. Anything that these people say, if you subject it to any kind of analysis, you will see how wrong, how misinformed, how misunderstood, and how incompetent they are. Any given issue, I have just chosen one at random, and Rabjatan lectures lecturing to me on the difference between the consolidated fund and an extra budgetary fund. And he doesn't understand it, as you would have seen. And he quotes the law correctly, but he doesn't understand what he's reading. He read the law correctly, but he doesn't understand what he read. And this is a lawyer of over 20, 30, 40 years standing at the bar. So you could imagine the level of incompetence in relation to the others. Because as I said, He's perhaps the longest serving parliamentarian on their side. He's the most experienced lawyer on their side. And if he is so incompetent, you could imagine the others. I thought that I will spend a few minutes to deal with that issue. So I hope that I have dealt with it to your satisfaction. I will post the two pieces of legislation on my Facebook page so that you can read it again to see that the two provisions are identical yet Ram Ramjatan finds a problem with ours and apparently didn't have a problem with theirs although there's not a single word different in the two provisions not a single word so let me go back let me go now to our budget please share the program with your friends please press that share button on your phone so that all those who are on your page on your program on your account will join us in tonight's discussion so our finance minister yesterday presented our national budget for the year 2024 and there are some broad comments that I want to make about the budget. The budget is by far the largest budget ever presented in our country. 1.146 trillion dollars. 1.146 trillion dollars. 
it is almost as twice the size of last year budget. Let me repeat that. It is almost twice the size of last year's budget. It's 46% bigger than last year's budget. And it is financed without a singular new tax or increase in taxation. Let me repeat that. It is being financed without a single dollar increase in any taxation or any additional new taxes. And it has a host of measures directed at every sector of the country. More than 75% of the budget is dedicated to the social sectors of our country. Over 75% of the budget of this sum of 1.46 trillion is directed to the social sectors. Why? Because the social sectors provides the different type of services that benefit the largest number of Guyanese. The social sectors include health. Whether you're rich, poor, Indian, black, Amerindian, Chinese, you are going to get sick and you will have to interact with the public health sector. That is one of the largest recipients of expenditures in this budget or allocations in this budget. Second, education. Whether you're rich, poor, or whichever geographic area you're from, whatever ethnic group you're from, your children, once you live in Guyana, will go to school. Our children are the future of our country. Our children are our most valuable assets. An investment in education is an investment in our most important asset. An investment in our education is an investment in our future. That is why over a hundred and thirty odd billion has been budgeted for the education sector. Thirdly, housing and water. Every Guyanese would like to own their own homes. And the government's pledge is to ensure that every Guyanese own their own home. Every Guyanese is entitled to portable water in their homes. The government pledge is to provide that service to every single Guyanese. Again, one of our largest budgetary allocations is in this sector. Fourthly, infrastructure. It is no secret that we have to build the infrastructure of our country as we move our standard of living forward. We have a new bridge across the Borbis River, across the Demerara River being constructed. We have new highways being built right across the length and breadth of our country, including the Mabura to Linden Highway, then the Mabura to Lethem Highway, 
We have the Schoonard to Crane Highway, then from Crane to Parika. We have, a, we have several new roads along the East Bank, alternative to the conventional East Bank public road. We have road linkages from East Bank straight along to the East Coast without coming through Georgetown. We have the Mandela Avenue extension. We have a new quarantine highway. And we have thousands of roads in the communities across this country that we are rebuilding. And we are building for the first time. We have the electrification. We are going through a new electrification program. We are building a gas to shore project that will ensure cheap, reliable electricity and cooking gas that will benefit generations of people, generations of Guyanese. That's the type of developmental foundation that we are laying and we are spreading out across the length and breadth of our country. In the Human Services Ministry is nearly $50 billion for old age pension and all the other services that are being offered by that ministry. In the justice sector, over $7 billion because the rule of law and justice are as important to people as food and water. They are as important to our democracy and to the stability of our country as everything else. Over $7 billion, nearly $7 billion have been expended, have been allocated for this sector. And I'll go into the measures shortly. Can you imagine when we begin to spend $1.146 trillion, how many jobs are going to be created. This money is going to be expended in Guyana. Not anywhere else. This explosion of expenditure will take place in Guyana. Money will be circulating in this economy. All these new projects will require employments. We have about eight five-star hotels under construction. I don't know how many will complete this year, but once they're completed, they will need hundreds of employees. All these contracts to execute them, our Guyanese will have to be employed. Yet, you will hear the opposition will tell you that one, nothing is in the budget. That's the first thing. $1.46 trillion in the budget, but you will hear that they will tell you that money is not in the budget. You will, they, you will hear they will tell you that no new jobs are being created. Though we have, we have budgeted billions for the University of, Edu uh, um, <clears throat> University of Guyana and the Gold Scholarship Program to train people to graduate people, and all these new vistas of development that are taking place across this country, for which this 1.14 trillion will be expended, will not create jobs. You will hear that they will tell you that this money, and they have already begun to say it, is to create opportunities for corruption. They, can, they, they are vacuous. They don't have an idea to contribute. They don't have an alternative development plan. They can't point to any track record of development when they were in government. But they have a whole host of ideas which they are keeping to themselves because they are not making it public. But you will hear in the budget debate, you, 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 the money will be stolen. The money will be stolen. They think that everybody is like them. They are salivating at these monies. When they hear these budgetary allocations, they are salivating. They are only thinking, oh my God, imagine if we were in government. When they were in government, the only thing 
that consistently increased was expenditures for diet. They increased their dietary line in the budget by billions. They were eating more, drinking more, traveling more, and having pomp and ceremonies. Big independence celebration, big republic celebration, big mashramani, big fet in Brooklyn, big fet in Atlanta. That is what they were concerned about. The fetting and the partying and the decoration of the place. Nothing constructive of our development. And eat a lot and drink a lot at the Marriott and at the Pegasus and all the drinking places and traveling first class around the world. That is what they were concerned about. That is where their money went. We are pointing to projects. We can point to the Barbies Bridge. We can point to the Demerara New Bridge. We can point to all the roadways. We can point to the 12 new hospitals that we are building. We can point to the new airport. We can point to things. Let them point. What are you going to point to? Dorman Park? They got 11 donkeys and 12 horses grazing in there. With about 1,400 vagrants. That's what they will point to? They will point to a roundabout at the mouth of his Indian road. They will point to two walkways, two over, overpass. Passengers overpass. Passengers overpass. That car overpass on the East Bank. None of which are working. Those are just their signal accomplishments in government. But you will hear them from next week in the parliament. What and what they, they, they should have done and which is their idea. Imagine we are bridging the Wisma Bridge. The Wisma Bridge needed to be bridged a long time ago. The leader of the opposition said that we stole his idea. Your idea, you had an exclusive idea to repair the bridge or build a new bridge across the Demerara River. These people, I don't think they even listen to themselves. I don't think they even listen to themselves. We are bridging the Quarantine River. We are bridging the Quarantine River. We already bridge the Takutu River. Create a link between Guyana and Brazil that you can drive over. We are now doing the same for the Quarantine River. This useless bunch are going to stand in the parliament the whole of next week and preach racism and corruption. You will hear them. Only about the, all they see is race. We are spending all these monies across every community in this country. But you will only hear about racism. You will only hear about racism and about corruption. Listen, starting Monday. But let's get back to the budget. So I'm not going to deal with the huge expenditures and the different projects. The ministers will be talking about that. But there are some real measures that are, are in the budget that will immediately impact in a positive way the lives of Guyanese from every sector. And let us start with the measure to contain the cost of fuel. There is nothing that causes an increase in prices across sectors, an increase in cost of living and inflation than the rise in the cost of fuel. Fuel is a very volatile item on the world market. The prices fluctuate Tremendously. Over the past two to three years, the fuel prices have risen dramatically. In Guyana, since 2022, the government of Guyana removed all taxes from fuel, including diesel and kerosene oil. All taxes so that 
you don't feel the increase. The gas price that you're paying for gas should have been much higher. That will result in increased taxi fares, increased minimus fares, and increase in light bills. You know what the cost of fuel to supply GPL? It went up by over 45 to 50 percent. But your light bill has not been raised by one cent over the past three years. The government absorbs that cost. And in the budget, we will be absorbing that cost for the entire year of 2024. That will cost the government for another $40 billion. We spent $40 billion in 2022 to keep the prices stable and to insulate you from the repercussions of increased prices. We did the same in 2023 and we are doing the same for 2024. $40 billion it is costing the Treasury. So when people asking where the oil money is going, it is going to keep your gas prices down. It is going to keep your electricity bill down. It is going to keep the taxi fares down. It is going to keep the bus fares down. And it's going to keep the, the cost of transportation down. That is where the monies are going. Reduction in freight charges. You would recall that as a result of the COVID-19 global pandemic, there was a meteoric rise in freight charges. I am an importer, or I used to import during that period. Prior to the COVID-19, the cost of a container, freight char charges from China to Guyana was 4,000 to 5,000 US dollars. By the end of 2020, the cost of freight from Guyana to China was about 18,000 US. From 5,000 US to about 18,000 US. And I'm not asking, I am not depending upon hearsay. I pay that myself to import containers from China. We, in 2021, the government intervened and reverted the calculation of duties and freight to a pre-pandemic price so that you don't pay. The consumer doesn't face the increase. We can control the cost of freight, but we can calculate your freight for the purpose of duties and taxes and VAT when you import the goods we can use a different calculation so that you don't pay taxes based upon freight, existing freight at the time. And that measure is what we introduced in 2021. And we have kept it going. And for the entire year of 2024, we will keep that going. That will cost us another $6 billion. That, my friend, is where your tax, your taxpayer money is going, and that is where the oil revenue is going. Because if the government does not intervene in this matter, that this manner, and allow you to pay, allow the importers to pay duties, VAT, and the other taxes leviable at the actual freight charges, the price of every single thing imported will skyrocket because the businessmen will put that increase into the price of the good. When you go to the shop, you will have to pay the increase in prices. The part-time program. In 2022, we introduced a part-time program that allowed for household members including women or with emphasis 
to women who are unemployed. We are giving them a part-time job and paying them $40,000 a month to work for 10 days. These are people who never earned. We are providing 10 days of work in the community and you're getting $40,000. Do you... We have employed 15,000 persons already. 15,000. And this year, we are expanding it. This money is going back into the village economy. If you live in Monrepo, you live in Reed and Hoop, you live in Buxton, you live in Anne's Grove, the $15,000, the, the, the $40,000 that you're getting is what you never used to get. And you're getting now to buy in the local market. That will energize the entire country because it's being done in every region. This money, $10 billion is allocated this year. $10 billion. We spent $6 billion in 2022. $10 billion will be spent. Let me just give you a practical example. The loan program that we have with the commercial banks for the low-income ho homes, that when you buy a low-income home and you go to NBS for a loan to fund that home, to pay off for that house, your mortgage installment at the bank is approximately $32,000 per month. This $40,000 will pay your mortgage and put enough there to pay off the interest. The $40,000. And your family doesn't have to touch their other sources of income. This is real help. This is where the oil money is going. $7 billion more have been set aside for the government to use during the year to deal with other repercussions that may occur so that your cost of living your cost of living will be controlled so that you wouldn't have to pay increase in prices this 7 billion will be used and determined after consultations with various sectors what measures we should employ to bring down cost of living in particular areas. <clears throat> we, are, we have worked out with the bank a $5 million loan limit at a rate of 3.5% interest to help small businesses. If you have a small business and you want to, a loan, the government has negotiated with the commercial banks a loan to about 5 million, maximum of 5 million, at a 3.5% interest. If you go to the bank ordinarily for a loan, you have to pay between 14 to 9% interest, depending upon what type of loan, how much money, and which bank. Between 9 to 14%. Government intervention is causing you to borrow up to $5 million for small business developments and you will only pay 3.5%. And this is just for you to start your business. We are removing duty and VAT on sports equipment and technology. So sports is crucial to the development of our young people, to the healthy lives of every citizen, and to create the type of social environment that we want in the country. That is why we are investing so heavily in sports facilities. Over 1,000 grounds are under refurbishment across the length and breadth of Guyana. 1,000. 
we are putting floodlights, we are building new pavilions, and, and other proper facilities at these recreation centers, 1,000 of them. And we are building several stadia. Linden has one, Borbis has one, and somewhere else there is a third. Essequibo. Thank you, operator. One in Essequibo. Three stadia in addition to 1,000 grounds. Now we are removing VAT and duty and sports equipment so that they can become more available, more um, affordable. We already took off VAT and applicable taxes from cell phones and data for personal and residential purposes. We already did that. In 2024 budget, VAT and duty on essential cell phone accessories such as chargers, charging cables, headphones, and other phone components will be removed. So VAT and cell phone accessories and duty will go. That is where every single Guyanese has a cell phone. Every single person will benefit from this measure and every other measure that I'm making reference to. Old age pension, when we came in from 2020, we moved it from 20,000 to 33,000. We are now increasing it from 33,000 to 36,000. This represents a 75% increase in old age pension and will benefit 76,000 people. And it will cost the government 2.7 billion. But it is 2.7 billion that we are giving back the population. I hear people, the opposition already started to scream, oh God, $3,000 only. But is that $3,000 in isolation? Is $3,000 with all the other things that we are doing. This singular measure is $2.7 Let's go to public assistance. Public assistance got an increase from $9,000 in 2020 to $16,000 in 2023. In addition, the government announced in 2022 that all disabled people would automatically be enrolled to receive public assistance on a monthly basis. That's what we did in 2023. With effect from January the 1st, 2024, there will be an increase in public assistance from $16,000 per month to $19,000. This will give over 35,000 people an additional $1.2 in disposable income. You cannot be myopic and look at one measure. You have to look at all the different measures. And mind you, I pause here to tell you or to remind you that all these measures are being implemented. All of them increases. Each one of them increase allocations. But there is not a single new tax. There is not a a single increase in existing tax or existing taxes. I test for school children. Over 205,000 school children and 76,000 pensioners will receive a $3,000 voucher towards the cost of an I test. Let me repeat that. 205,000 school children and 76,000 pensioners will receive a $3,000 voucher towards the cost of an eye test. This will cost over $840 million. So in addition to the $3,000 that I spoke about earlier, the old people getting another $3,000 to go and test the eye. And now when they go to the, buy the spectacles, they will get 
$15,000 voucher towards the spectacle. They will get another $15,000 towards the purchase of a spectacle. You want to point to any other country in the Caribbean that has these measures? You want to point to any other country in the third world that has these measures? You want to point to the United States of America that has these measures? There you have to pay insurance. A large chunk of your income goes every month to insurance before you can get any medical benefits. This is the government spending all of this without a contribution, without a single contribution from the beneficiaries. Not like in the U.S. where you have to pay insurance premiums. This here is gratuitous. And it will, this facility will extend countrywide. Because the Minister of Finance pointed out that even in the hinterland areas where you may have difficulties in accessing a doctor, we will take the doctors there and they will do the eye tests in the hinterland community. Point to which country in the Caribbean or in the third world or in the first world where you have facilities like this. Then we move to Cervical cancer testing. In order to support cervical cancer testing, the government will offer women between the ages of 21 and 65 an 8,000 voucher, $8,000 voucher to help with the expense of testing. A lot of our women are affected this way. $2.8 billion dollars is budgeted to cater for this voucher of $8,000 that you will get to pay towards the test. And this is not only at the public hospital, you can cash this at any hospital, at any of the private hospital of your choice. So you see the money that the government is spending in the private sector as well? This spectacles is not public hospital you're going. You're going to any of the opticians in the country and they will benefit. They will benefit from your business. So the government is pumping millions into the private sector. That is how you develop a country. NIS move from 35,000 to 43,000. Survivor benefits, that is if your husband die, the wife will now get $21,600 million has been allocated. We are giving a pension now we, we are going to pay off. Remember, a lot of people did not make the 750 contribution at NIS. Well, we are putting in a measure to help those who got between 700 to 749 contributions. So if you have not made the 750 contributions, but you have made 700, then you will get a one-off payment. Over 3,800 people will benefit from this intervention. And this will cost $550 million. And let me wrap up because I have so many to deal with. The, the, the cash grant. The cash grant, since we came into office, we restored it. APNU AFC had cut it out. That's the first thing. And you can hear the shouting about school children in the parliament from Monday. How they care for school children. Yet one of the first things that they did when they go into, went into the office, they cut the cash grant out. We restored it and raised it from 10,000 to 20,000 when we took office in 2020. 
We raised it to 35,000 in the 2023 budget. And this year, we're raising it to 40,000. And that is in addition to the $5,000 uniform voucher. So it's 45,000 per child. 205,000 children will benefit. 205,000 children will benefit. This is 9.2 billion. Where do you think this money going? You're spending it at the market. You're spending it in the community. You're spending it in the local economy. Who will, who, who will you buy from? The private sector. You see how the money is passing hand? The opposition will never see this. Somehow they will find corruption. <coughs> Somehow they will say that afro guyanese children are not getting this grant. Although 90% 90, 90 of the Ministry of Education staff who are running this program are afro guyanese And over 70% of the teachers in the country are afro guyanese And they are distributing this grant. But APNU AFC will want to say in the parliament, that afro guyanese children are getting this grant. So the afro guyanese people in the Ministry of Education and the afro guyanese teachers in the country are deliberately preventing afro guyanese children from getting this grant. That is the kind of madness that they speak in the parliament that you will hear. And let me conclude with the income tax threshold. We have moved the income tax threshold from 65,000 to 75,000 in 2022, then to 85,000 in 2023. This year, we are raising it to 100,000. What that means is that $100,000 of your salary is income tax free. So if you're working for $200,000, you're only paying income tax on the last hundred. The first hundred thousand dollars is tax free. This will cost the government four point eight billion dollars in disposable income. My friends, I have done just a synopsis of the budget measures and try to explain it to you in the simplest language so that you understand so that you people have a fair understanding of what the budget holds for Guyana and Guyanese. But you will hear from the opposition when they begin their speeches of gloom and doom in the parliament from Monday. Thank you very much for spending the last hour with me. Please enjoy the rest of your evening and stay healthy until we meet again. We will not be having issues in the news next week, Tuesday, because I will be in Parliament, but I'll be streaming, I believe we will be streaming Budget Debate Live from my Facebook page. So thank you very much, and until I see you after the conclusion of the Budget Debates, take care and stay healthy.